All right, and we're back with uh, round two uh, of our time with Ryan sitting today, and we're going to pivot to a leadership discussion. Uh, this is the Gulf Coast Growth Show with the Houston Economic Alliance Port Region. As always, if you're not tuned in and connected to the work that we're doing, we are a, really a third party advocate or voice for industry here in our region, uh, centered around driving jobs, uh, opportunities, development, funds, anything that we can do to help build on our beautiful, great city of Houston, Texas, and all of those things that support our port. So the refineries, um, you know, being a, a Deer Park and a, 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 a native, uh, you know, we, we, we take a lot of pride in looking over to the right and seeing the stacks up in the air because, uh, you know what, there's a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities and things that come from us. So very proud native and also uh, having joined us with a guy who has a business tucked away in that corner. And so we're going to talk about that today. I know um, we actually had your team on uh, a few weeks ago uh, discussing some of the work you were doing from a um, really from a bottom line perspective, approaching the business differently and then taking what your, your you know, Pinnacle does and, and leading a few workshops and or about a six week course, which is really about impact in the bottom line. And so I love it because it's about innovation. I think we're all gonna really require an innovation. I actually have a client of ours. Um, they are in oil and gas consulting and um, right there, it's just a great story of the entrepreneurial journey, right? These are great leaders. Uh, I tell the story, but I, I think it's a powerful one. On March, uh, we delivered a proposal for them, shut down. One week later, hey, let's, we're going to kind of see how this is. Three months later, we're back in discussion with them because, you know, they went through the same thing every leader went through. Oh, my God, I don't know what's happening. Oh, my God, am I going to be in business? Oh, my God, I'm a victim and life sucks. And I, how am I ever going to do this? And yada, yada, yada to, oh wait, hold on, we've been talking about all these other things we wanted to do, products, product line, distribution channels, things we, we knew we could do because of our skill set. Perhaps now is the time, fast forward three months, this business is, uh, their trajectory is right back to where they were. Uh, I got a phone call says, hey, we'd like to get back in for a discussion. Um, let's, let's, let's get that proposal fired up. I'm like, hey, praise God, uh, we're talking to them. And just like a multitude of business owners, I think they went through that stage. Oh my God, I don't, I, I, I don't know what's happening. I don't wanna believe this is happening. And you, know, you kind of have two choices. Either I'm gonna you know, fold, I'm gonna give up everything that I've done. And unfortunately, in some instances, some people have had to do that, not because, um, not because they were bad leaders or because they didn't have the grit or the fortitude, but frankly, um, you know, I have a, a good friend and they, they had purchased and acquired a lot of real estate and their business relies on traffic. And it was just really, really atrocious timing because they came cash tight and walked into a, a difficult position with some new buildings. So some of that's not people's fault, but at the same time today, we're gonna to talk about those that are living, breathing, and then how you push forward. And so you've shifted to the CEO role, Ryan. Um, uh, meaning taking the reins back and saying, how do I, how do I go make Pinnacle uh, uh, really a flagship company on the other side of this? How do we make a tremendous impact? And I think it starts with leadership. So let's talk about that. Um, first of all, you've had to take a shift. Okay. Uh, and when I say had to take a shift, meaning the sliding into the new role, I, I, I know uh, for those that don't know, but you know, in the, in the transition from Texas Rail, Rail Commissioner, that, that's coming up, right? It's, it's in the forefront. So to be able to, I, I don't know, I can't, I don't think a lot of people could understand what it feels like to have to step up in a role and then know that subsequently that role won't be there for you in a few months, um, if that's, if I'm not mistaken. And so with that coming down the pipeline, you're still out here leading, lead the charge, doing the thing, but now you're going to kind of pivot back into, uh, I mean, you know, running the company. You're going to go back to a different hat. So before we do that, let's talk about uh, that experience because I think there's a lot of humility in that. And I think uh, our audience could stand to gain and glean some insight from that because um, you didn't fold. You, 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 you know, I, I actually saw a, a lot of uh, conversation from you about that, but I think our audience could stand to hear what's it like. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of us probably thought, Hey, Ryan's Ryan's in like, that's a, that's a no brainer. And then and I thought that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we all thought that. Um, and so, and, and it showed up and participated for it. And so that, but it didn't happen. So um, I, I don't know. I think a lot of people see you and they see you speak and they see your articulation around leadership and they think there's no way this guy loses a game. Like this guy's probably won every game he's ever played in. You know, he's probably, you know, you sign up for a game of uh, whatever, um, uh, uh, 
poker or, or goldfish with them. And it's like, damn, Ryan keeps winning goldfish. I, you know, why, why does this always happen to Ryan? So tell us about that, uh, that, that experience and then also how it's prepared you for this upcoming experience sliding into your, uh, back into the CEO chair. Yeah. Well, there, there's a long, thanks for that setup, Jason. There's a bit of a long story here. I'm going to try to condense it. Great. You got to really go back to 2014, 2013, as a matter of fact, you know, I, I had never growing up, that's seven years ago. So I'm, you know, 36 years old or so, 37 years old. And I'm like, I mean, I didn't really ever thought I'd be a guy running for public office. It just, I didn't grow up thinking that my parents weren't politically active, but as our business started growing back in the, in the, you know, I started Pinnacle in 2006 and through the late 2000s and then early 2010s, really, man, started paying attention to politics a lot and, and realizing the pretty big impact it is having on our lives today from both the, the everything for the, the presidential level through Senate and Congress all the way down to, to city council. I mean, the, you know, we, we live in a very connected world and politics has a pretty major impact. And I was frustrated at the time. This is once again, 2012, 2011, with the lack of understanding of the energy business in our society. And especially in politics, right? Like when you think about these policies make a profound impact on how much we pay for gasoline, how, how we compete overseas if you're in a manufacturing business and energy is one of your big costs. So in 2013, then Railroad Commissioner Barry Smitherman announces he's going to run for attorney general. His seat was going to be open. I had had some exposure folks in politics start talking to people. And sure enough, end of 2013, say, I'm going to run for Texas Railroad Commissioner. Spend 2014 running for office. I won the, the primary. I, I went through a primary, then a runoff. This is the Republican primary of 2014. Uh, ended up getting elected. November of 2014 was sworn in December of 2015. I'm uh, sorry, January of 2015. And for a six-year term. And I'm going through, and I've been a very active railroad commissioner. I'm out. I, I love talking to groups about what's happening in energy markets. As you said, Jason, I, I'm, I'm in, in front of groups and talking. I have a real passion for this. I'm the first engineer to serve as a railroad commissioner in 50 years. Oh, wow. and, and certainly the first one in, in maybe forever who had, a, who had run a really successful international energy services and technology company. So I, I, knew, I know a lot about markets and really enjoyed serving in that capacity. Well, coming up to this year, so, so 2019 and, and 2020, you know, all of the talk was about the general election. You know, the, the, the things are getting closer. Demographics in Texas is changing. Remember when Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke ran against each other in 2018, that race was really close. So I was really focused on the general. We started hearing that, man, there's going to be some well-funded Democrats, which in the past, statewide races were all Republican. I mean, it, wasn't, was, it, was, a, it was a formality, the general. Well, this time I'm going in, I don't have any competitors in the primary. And then sure enough, lo and behold, right before the filing deadline closed, December of last year, December of 2019, some guy files to run against me in the Republican primary. He, over the course of the, the January, February, raises no money, um, never goes to any events. I mean, we never even see the guy. I ran a poll in like December to see, does this guy have, and I, I was in, when I ran the poll, I was up 60-40. So, man, I've got this. Let's focus on the general. Let's save my campaign money to the general. Well, sure enough, I, I, I you know, am in that mindset. And I, in fact, March 3rd of this year was primary election day, right? The early vote been going on for two weeks. I actually had conference. So I had to be in Austin on Wednesday morning. I leave Houston Tuesday at 5 o'clock on election day. And I'm driving to Austin. Then I'm driving by myself thinking that the primary is a formality. Nobody even cares about my race, right? I'm going to win. And it's all about the general. I leave Houston at five o'clock driving to Austin. By the time I, I'm thinking this is a formality, nothing to see here. You know, I'm not even really checking the election results. I arrive in Austin at nine, nine o'clock that night and I'd lost the election. I mean, completely blindsided, had no clue it was coming. Oh my gosh. Now what, and I will tell you that, um, that night I'm just like, I can't sleep. I'm alone in my condo in Austin. Talk to my, my, uh, kids and my wife about what had happened. Everyone's just like, what the heck? I'm talking to my staff, my staff who now, you know, when you're, when you work for an elected official directly and that elected official loses election, you're out of a job as soon as he's gone. So I've got the lame duck period, but man, it was just, I was just shell shocked. Well, I barely sleep that night. Just kind of wondering what the heck happened. Um, wake up Wednesday, meet with my staff that morning. We have conference. I'll tell you, Jason, by the time I get to lunch Wednesday morning, so probably, Oh, 16 hours after I realized I'd lost the election, I'm sitting at lunch in Torchy's Tacos in Austin. <laughs> I'm going, man, this is a good thing. Believe it or not, it took me six, only 16 hours. So this is a good thing. And I'm, I'm thinking about my time in public office, what I've done in that space and how much I really enjoy private business. And I am 
tremendously blessed, Jason, in that Pinnacle, the company I founded that I had not been the CEO of for nearly six years, I guess five and a half years, um, I still own that company. And I love that company. I love the, the new opportunities that are coming. So this was, this is March 4th, right? And this is all going on through my head. Now you ask, well, what happened? The short version is a, a really salacious, nasty website was put up the week before early voting started. And it said the most horrible made up things you've ever seen. And it just, I won't even tell you what it was. And we kind of thought, man, no one, no one's even believing this. The media is not, everyone knew it was a sham. Well, once we polled after the election, that website went just enough viral that 10% of the voters saw it and switched. So I went from being up, call it 55-45, to being down 55-45, just like that, with one website that went viral. And I wasn't ready for it, it was my own fault. What I learned from this was I should have been ready, I should have polled the week before early, I should have had a campaign plan, because I had campaign funds, but I was saving it for the general. I should have been ready so that when, so that I could have polled the week before early voting started, when I, and if I was seen that, man, this website's getting traction, it's gone viral, I didn't know that. If I'd have known that, then I could have put all my money and I, I could have launched the campaign, sent out a bunch of mailers, done a bunch of robocalls and won the election. And in the end, I think I'm blessed that I didn't win the election. But the lesson to learn is I got complacent, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, dude, I'm successful. Everybody loves me. I got the governor, lieutenant governor. I got Ted Cruz's endorsement. Pfft, this is, I got this. I get cream because I got complacent and I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared, right? Wow. So that's a, that's a big lesson to learn from that. But now it's March 4th, right? I'm like, okay, I've lost this election. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go back and be the CEO at Pinnacle. In fact, to tell a little bit more of the story, Jason, the last CEO at Pinnacle had actually resigned April of last year because he was going to join a startup, like a brand new startup that he was investing in. And we had spent the last, last part of 2019, the first part of 2020, interviewing CEO candidates. Oh, wow. Trying to find a new CEO of Pinnacles. So March 3rd, I lose the election, right? I said, I, I get into Austin. It's nine o'clock. I realize I've lost the election. We sent out a, 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 a um, okay, thank, congratulations to my, component, to my opponent. I lost the election, kind of, kind of concede the election. And then that evening, March, March 3rd, like 10 o'clock at night, I send an email to everybody at Pinnacle and I say, hey, by the time you wake up, you'll be realizing I lost the election. I've been really blessed to service. I've learned a ton about, about the energy industry. I've learned a ton about service. I've been a, got a chance to do so many cool things. And, I'm, and now I get the chance to bring all that cool education, all that knowledge and all that experience back to serving our customers and serving you as the CEO. In short, the CEO job at Pinnacle has been filled. I'm back, baby. I said that even last <laughs> night. So it was like, it was, I love it. Was it. By Wednesday morning, like Wednesday at lunch, I'm like, this is sort of washing over me that I now get to go back and do this. Now, keep in mind, this is March 4th. I, I leave that Friday to go on a week long spring break ski trip with my family, all right, which we'd already had planned. We go to Breckenridge. I leave Breckenridge on Friday. Breckenridge shuts down two days later due to coronavirus. So the wave of coronavirus, not even a week after I lose the election, the wave of coronavirus is coming through. Companies are starting to lock down between March and April. Pinnacle, for the first time ever, Pinnacle has had to downsize this year. We have grown steadily 14 years, grown every single year in revenue and employees. This will be our first year to turn down. So not only am I back as the CEO, but I'm back as CEO right in the middle of all of this downturn hitting, right? All of this, all these challenges, which once again was a blessing, right? Like that's where I want to be in the middle of all this. I need to be at the company where that I'm responsible for and all these employees I'm responsible for managing this downturn. We had to have layoffs, never had layoffs before. And now we're having a layoff. We went from about 850 down to had to laugh about a hundred people. Now we're blessed. I mean, we're still, we're still strong. We're still profitable. Man, to have layoffs, we've never done that before. Yeah. So to be able to, to sort of be forced back into that, I say forced to, to, to be, to have that thrust on you when you weren't expecting it. And then to go through all this, man, it was just a, it was just a humbling and eye opening experience. And I was really, really blessed to get to serve and blessed to go through all this. And I'm blessed to be where I'm at today. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think uh, there's, there's no better uh, person position for greatness than somebody who's faced that type of adversity when they, when they run into something and then they, they have to face that humility of, you know, I didn't keep my eye on the ball. Um, yeah. I think uh, I went through that as a multi-unit leader before where, you know, I had uh, about five or six people lost a competition um, because I took that competition for granted. You know, they were coming to my market. They didn't have what I believe to be a very strong position. And I just said, no way, not happening. 
and woke up uh, at a, uh, to about three or four people in a 60 day period of time on their way out and scrambling to figure it out. And that cost me, you know, probably about almost nine months of, of, uh, of, of uphill battle, you know, working, working weekends to cover shifts for my clubs and teams and stuff, you know, having to step in and do other people's roles because I had a bomb go off in my backyard. So yeah, uh, very humbling experience. Now talk about, um, now you're in the position now. I mean, not only to combine uh, the loss of that role, pivot into your new role, op, op, you know, optimistic, probably re rekindled some time up in the mountains with your family, getting right with God, having a good time, looking at all the blessings. And I'm like, all right, let's go back and crush it over at Pinnacle. And then bam, bottom drops out and you're probably faced with immediate I mean, to, to lay off. So we all know that at your, at your, um, at your, from your inside out, you're, you're a, a wonderful human who also has a very good compassion for people, uh, probably at your core. That's probably what makes you so good at your job. Knowing that and knowing that about you, um, having to lay people off is not easy. Having to make that decision, oh, yeah. probably, uh, probably uh, just as hard as being on the phone trying to make an oil and gas decision uh, with, you know, guys from Saudi Arabia and Russia, you know, those are, I can only imagine the magnitude of having to make that call. So how do you equip yourself for the next five years? What do leaders need to take for today and looking into the next one, what does it look like for leadership? Well, I'll tell you what, there's nothing better, but if you're about to go into your, the, one of the biggest challenges of your life, like there's this massive global virus, your customers are, are having huge challenges across the board. You have to share in that with them. Nothing prepares you for that better, believe it or not, Jason and forgive my language, then getting kicked, getting kicked right in the nuts right before you go into that. <laughs> because it tells you, holy cow, I got complacent and lost this selection. I, I can't be complacent. I, when we go, now that this stuff is coming, like I, I, was, I was ready. I was, I was cued into, man, I can't sit back and wait for and, and hope this works out, right? And talking about a pinnacle, we got to take action now. And so while it is terribly difficult, to tell an employee, hey, I'm sorry, we don't have enough work for you. The fact is, you knowing that you have to do that because you got to put the, the health of all 800 people, you know, ahead of just the health of the few that you don't have work for. So the decision actually, I won't say it was easy, but we knew it was right. But we made them quickly and we did it, did it with the speed we needed to. Now, what does that mean in terms of the next five years? The opportunities coming today, Jason, are going to be bigger. Uh, let me say this. So I got a good friend of mine runs a massive private equity firm. And he said, a, he said a sentence to me that I have quoted a number of times. He said, Ryan, I believe that the opportunities are going to be, this is about three months ago. Ryan, I believe the opportunities are going to be bigger in the next 12 months than they will ever be in our lifetime. And the reason he was saying that is he was saying right now, you think about when you go to a customer, Jason, or I go to a customer, and everybody's got a customer, whether you sell cell phones, cars, you uh, work in a clothing store, you go to a restaurant, right? At the end of the day, there, there, are, there are buyers and sellers, right? There's a customer, right? You go to a customer and say, hey, I've got an idea, right? I, I want to sell you a product and I think this product is going to be good for you. It's going to help you. At the end of the day, you know this about Pinnacle. We help make our customers' facilities more reliable yep. so that they, they spend less money and, and run more and have less safety incidents. We make their facilities perform better. But in the end, when we go to them, we are asking them to change something about the way they do business. We've got a way for you to do this that is different than what you've done in the past. Well, as you know, people don't like change, right? There's a barrier to change. I'm gonna tell you, Jason, right now, that barrier is as low as it's ever going to be. When, mm -hmm. when every business out there is going through dramatic headwinds, I don't care, once again, real estate, healthcare, technology, automotive, uh, hospitality, whatever, you're experiencing massive headwinds. And so you're like, man, I gotta change. Everyone who is leading is saying it. So now this is our opportunity to lean into that change. As leaders, if we're saying, hey, how do we bring new ideas, new technology, new approaches, new services, whatever it is, focused on helping our customers deal with their challenges instead of worrying about me and my challenges, those are the guys, Jason, who will be better off in a year or two because of coronavirus than they would have been without it. Let me say that differently. I'm going to say this about Pinnacle. I believe that in five years, Pinnacle will actually be bigger and will have a bigger presence than we would have if, if coronavirus had not hit because it forced us to say, how can we better serve this market, right? 
In yeah. the middle of time, you've never seen Chevron, Exxon, BP, and Shell all at the same time announce massive um, capital cuts, massive employee cuts, and, and layoffs. You've never seen it all at the same time. They're all facing the same headwinds, and those are just the majors, right? You can get into the large companies, petrochemicals, mining, water, you name it. When they're all hitting those challenges, if we say, how do we help them through those challenges and develop better methodologies, better services, man, that's, that's a huge opportunity. And it's, it's right out there in front of us. So some leaders right now are gonna be tempted to kind of entrench, right? They're scared, they're gonna hunker down. You, you talk about being a victim. And not necessarily that they're a victim, but they just say, man, I'm scared. Let me just, let me just try to maintain what I've got. They're gonna struggle. Those who say, man, this is difficult. Let me use this to pivot. Let, let me learn from this and add new things or change the way we do things to go offer a different service, a better service. Those are the people that are gonna grow. And so we're seeing a lot of opportunity condensed into one window because of this downturn. And I'll layer one other thing onto this. Jason, how, how long in, in virtually every business for the last three or four years, the world's been talking about data, 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 data. How do you use your data? What are you doing with data? Internet of things, machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data this, dark data that. I mean, data everywhere. And right now, what we've learned from coronavirus, I, I think that, that we will look back at, at in the next five to 10 years, in fact, my book, Crucial Decisions, has a lot in there about how, how our officials and leaders looked and made decisions on coronavirus and made a lot of mistakes because they were reacting to public sentiment and to different experts' opinions instead of reacting to the data. And so my point is, that's been another thing we're going to learn from this. And people are going to talk, how do we use data and everything from insurance to healthcare to energy to better run our businesses? That's going to create a lot of opportunity too. So my point is, you asked me about the next five years, I think there is going to be massive amounts of opportunity. And those who are really digging in and thinking about how do I make my customer, whoever it is, make their life better, make their experience better, make them more profitable, whatever, changing what I do to do that, those are the people who are going to thrive over the next few years. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head um, talking about the, the ability to embrace that change and then uh, really look for what your customers needs are. We just had that same meeting and I believe that, you know, my, my firm focuses on working with entrepreneurs, business owners, the, the creators, the, the folks that really drive the economy. And so, the thing that I keep coming back to in all their discussions and every, every deal is it's, it's I'm on the defense, but I'm looking for um, offense, meaning I'm, 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 I've had to, I've had to take an, a, a defensive approach immediately because I want to be here to then make the decisions. But now it's, what's the new vertical? What's the new, you know, you're an IT firm. Uh, so meaning you guys are built on technology. So to be a technology firm and not thrive in the next five years would be a shame, frankly, right? It, you would be missing out. Um, yep. And so whether you're in construction and you're trying to say, well, there's less projects, well then how do you become more efficient? Or how, if you're um, in architecture and there's less projects, well, how do you, uh, how do you create more from, you know, from a remote workplace, perhaps you mitigate and you get your team to work or how do you drive employee uh, buy in engagement when they aren't in the office every day through uh, effectively telling your story. I always talk a lot about, you know, if you're a leader, you can have a re really great um, job, you can have a really great role, but driving people to go that extra mile comes from buy-in. It comes from how are they connected to your mission, to your visions, to the passion that you have. And so this is a really great time for a leader to step back and say, do I even have that? You know, um, is this person going to jump ship from a job to another job because it offers a little bit more because they're no longer in the office with the team. I can't keep track on them, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now it's a good chance to go back and kind of get a gut check and say, you know, where's my vision? What's my mission? And do those things translate to my employees? And then are we being creative and, and moving forward? So um, let's, let's wrap up a little bit and talk about your book. So one is around data. You just talked a little bit about it, but why don't you tee that up and, and give us kind of an overarching theme. And then the other one, I think, is a little bit more pivoted towards le leadership, right? And so That's right. talk a little bit about both of them and what we can see on the rise. Yeah, thank you, Jason. So two books. And, and in fact, I wrote the first, the, the the one I wrote first is actually coming out second. It's called The Myth of Status. It's coming out in November and it's a leadership book. And when I say it's leadership, it's really focused on how do I unlock my, my ability and my, every one of our, how do we each unlock our ability to have an impact on the world? And often the, the premise of the book is we tend to get caught up in status. A lot of people think leadership is about status, position on an org chart, title, 
you know, the way you dress, you know, have, have your success, money, that's, it's not true. Leadership is about how you impact others and how you inspire others. And I talk about the five elements of success, which are service, vision, communication, focus, and perseverance. Mm -hmm. I walk through how leaders use all of those. And in each of those cases, you know, you, you have to get your own mindset around status. You know, am I getting mine? Am I, am I getting what I'm due? Am I getting what I'm entitled to? Get all that out of your head and say, how do I use service and vision and communication and focus and perseverance to have a positive impact on others. And, and so the whole book kind of unpacks that process for people to go through to really kind of unlock their own leadership. I believe that every one of us is a leader. We kind of think of people like, oh, well, look at Ryan Sutton. He's dressed nice, he's on camera, he's articulate. Well, I wasn't always this way, right. right? And leadership is not about these things. For some people, it can be really quiet. They lead from a support function, right? Or they lead through a, an individual service function. Some people are, are really, are they're brilliant in their ideas and they lead from an inspirational perspective. But it, each of us can unlock that if we just get out of the, the sort of preconceived notions about leadership that, that is about an image and get into what does it really mean to be a leader? That's the myth of status. Yeah, there's a lot of great books. Oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, there's, I had an uncle who passed away, but I always use that example because uh, he just put his head down and went to work and none of us really knew anything about his leadership. And then it was like in a movie when uh, when he passed away and the funeral came, there was just this, this row of cars just all the way as far as you could see. And we thought, I don't get it. The guy was like a farmer. He worked really hard. And then they, you know, people came up and said, well, he, this family was out and he came in and helped fix this. And this family did this. But he never, you know, he wasn't the for the, the big, bo boisterous, uh, you know, fancy suit where, I mean, as a matter of fact, he just had, you know, worked big swollen hands from working out on the field all day and doing things like that. But he had built a legacy inside of our farm and used that awesome. to feed him. But, you know, I use that as an example because a lot of us think that, you know, and, and I think one thing I will touch up on this is we need great leaders with great missions that also carry themselves with the right uh, values and core nature. We've become, in my opinion, we start to look at leaders um, as, and again, it's not to take anything away from these guys, but a lot of the people who are getting accolades are people who have almost this brash kind of in your face, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, Gary Vanderchuk style where, you know, I, I like what he does. He's entrepreneurial in spirit, great guy, but you know, it's kind of like F you, if you don't think this way and we've kind of lost our way as to where there's a guy who steps up and you say, yeah, I'd love for my daughter to listen to this guy talk. I'd love for my daughter to sit in this, this person's classroom and hear what yeah. they have to say. Not that there's some value there, but I think we have to start to kind of embrace a good cultural assessment of people and say, Hey, this guy's not only a great leader in the community and all these things, but he doesn't have to do it by, you know, uh, attacking people on his way up to the top. He's kind of supporting people in another way. So I think uh, it's good to see that kind of being, I'm, I'm excited for you putting a book out about it. So that's great. Talk about your, uh, your, your other book. Well, first thing I said, I wrote that book, The Myth of Status, it took me about two and a half years to write it. Oh, wow. I'm working on my own leadership principles and lessons I'd learned, all that kind of stuff. The second book, which actually comes out in September, literally in a month, is called Crucial Decisions. This book, Jason, took me two weeks to write. Oh, wow. I went from writing a book in two and a half years to two weeks. And I'll tell you, my secret was another book by a guy named Cal Newport called Deep Work. It's one of my top five books of all time. And I even talk about it in The Myth of Status when I talk about focus. And I, this time what I did is I went up to our place in Tennessee and I sat in a cab and I wrote straight for a week. Just, just cranked out work, writing eight, nine hours a day. Man, I, I was, I'd never done this before. I'm not a, I'm not a writer. But I had all these ideas. And this one was around how we look at complex situations and make decisions around what to do in those complex situations. Complex situations like what do I do with a global pandemic that's going to affect so many areas of our society? Complex situations like what do I do with this refinery that has 50,000 different assets that all have to run to make this plant do its thing? We run into those complex situations all the time. And we have to get better at using data real time in more quantitative ways to make decisions. And we can look back at examples in history. For example, if you've seen the movie Moneyball or you've read the movie Moneyball about the Oakland Athletics in the early 2000s and how they used data to change their baseball recruiting strategy, the scouts at the time said, this is total horse manure. This is not going to work. You can't tell, machine can't tell me how to recruit. Oakland Athletics went to have the longest winning streak in baseball history, I think, that oh. season with recruiting a bunch of players that their data 
said we're going to be good, but other players, other teams didn't see that. Of course, now today, all teams are doing it, right? There's a book called Astro Ball about how the Houston Astros took that idea and went on, you know, to put it on steroids. So my point is getting into really these complex situations in society. And that's what the book Crucial Decisions is about. Um, and I walk through a lot of examples and how we use data to make more quantitative decisions and everything from how we run our business to healthcare to education. And, um, and I, I go through some of the examples of coronavirus and what we've learned and experienced and, and failures and successes during coronavirus to help us as a society and as leaders think differently about how we use data and make important decisions. Great. So for anybody that's listening, uh, as we get ready to wrap up the show, talking about those two books, do you, uh, I know people can go, is there a, is there a Ryan, Ryan Sitton page? Is there a page yeah. that people can uh, go and then start to follow you or track any of your information outside of Pinnacle ART's website? Is there a, where do I go to keep up with Ryan? Yep. It's just ryansitton.com, R-Y-A-N-S-I-T-T-O-N.com. My books are both there. There's, a, there's content on those books that there to explain those. Of course, they'll be on Amazon, that sort of thing here in the next. You're going to go on Amazon and pre-order, but um, they'll, be a, they'll actually be available for delivery, like I said, crucial decisions in September. Also, I'm, we're act, I'm pretty active on social media. Twitter, uh, LinkedIn are the ones I use the most. I have Facebook as well. Th those three are the ones where you can follow me. I tend to do most of my leadership stuff on Facebook and, and LinkedIn. Then I use LinkedIn and Twitter for more data analytics and data science stuff. Great. Fantastic. Well, uh, Ryan, we appreciate you being, uh, again, part of the episode, uh, the last two, really. Um, and so for our audience, uh, again, tune in to Ryan's uh, book releases over the next, really, three and 90 days. Um, RyanSitton.com, great place to stay and follow. I've been following him for a while on LinkedIn. Uh, he does some great stuff when it comes to leadership, always communicating a phenomenal story. Um, as we talk about the mission and hope of this show, which is to drive productivity here in our region, I think it's important to note our region is strong because of the entrepreneurial spirit. Our region is strong because of the uniformed uh, uh, passion that our, we share for our Gulf Coast and especially for the great state of Texas and for the city of Houston. So as we bring this in, I think uh, Ryan exudes that and there's multiple examples. So I would encourage you to follow stuff pick up his stuff and then challenge yourself as you go forward in the next you know, really five years, just take a step back and, and digest some information. Don't sit still and then determine where you're going to take the most action uh, and where you're going to make the biggest difference. So again, follow us regularly. Uh, the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Coast Growth Show, you can access uh, our subscription link at the Houston uh, Port Authority uh, Economic Alliance, or I'm sorry, not Authority, the, H the Economic Alliance Houston Port Region. You can tune in uh, and check out any of our information anytime. Uh, subscribe to LinkedIn um, uh, with my, myself, my, my co-host, uh, Clint Aiken, and sub uh, subscribe to any of our channels. I just lost it there at the end. Like normally <laughs> really, really good. And I must have like ran out of copy. So uh, we appreciate you guys and uh, tune in to us next week. See you later.